Now, today I want to tell you a couple of stories, um, and then we're going to look at Jesus um, and his interaction with his disciples. Um, I'm not claiming to be an expert on this. Um, I just wanted, to, I've been thinking all week, what's the best way to kind of share this story? And I, and I think more than, more than most, it's just, just to share stories and be honest. Um, so we think about that question today, how do we worship? Now, in a function room not far from here, uh, an American man came with a very specific ministry to Christians, and I partook in a meeting that was extraterrestrial. Um, th- this man came with a very specific ministry of um, prophetic and piano at the same time. And uh, the man would give prophetic words and he would play his piano and, and that's how the, the act went. Now, I don't want you to think throughout this process that I'm bashing the prophetic. In fact, if it wasn't for a prophetic word that somebody spoke over me when I was 17, I'd, I honestly don't know where I'd be without it. Uh, I'm not bashing the prophetic here, but this time was particularly extraterrestrial. So, um, we all go to this meeting and this guy quotes a bit from the book of Ezekiel and he, he talks about the cherubims. And the cherubims essentially form wheels under the throne of God, right? There's this part in Ezekiel 10 where the cherubims form, form wheels under the throne of God. And, 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 and as that, he, he quotes the scripture and it says, it looks as if there's a wheel inside a wheel. The cherubims move and the throne moves and the presence of God sits on top of the wheels on the throne. Jesus, uh, God is on that throne. The wheels are turning round, right? Then he jumps on the piano, Okay, and he goes, this song will get catchy. You'll think about this tonight, and you'll be thinking that stupid song that Andy Clark said to me this morning. It goes to this. It goes, the wheels are turning round. They're turning round and round. The wheels are turning round, round and round. Okay, so I'm in a function room not far from here with big circular tables like you could get at Union Road. Okay, and, uh, and then he says, grab the hand of the person next to you and stand up. So (laughs) I join in. (laughs) I I grab the person's hand. And then he goes, now walk around the tables as we sing the song. So it goes, the wheels are turning round, they're turning round and round. The wheels are turning round, round and round. Okay. And then there's a man on the edge of this function room with a pint of tenants looking in. (laughs) Not quite believing what is happening. And, uh, and then he says, at, at some of my meetings, uh, uh, gold dust and diamonds appear at, at, at this meeting. So we're there, we're continuing with the song. The wheels are turning round, they're turning round and round, the wheels are turning round, round and round. And we're processing round the tables in a function room not far from this location. And uh, we do this process, and then somebody loses their mind. And they go, ah! And they, they find something on the ground, right? And it's, it's uh, incredibly shiny. It's like... It's like a diamond. And at that point, it just moves into a different extraterrestrial plane. People are doing all sorts of things, dancing around tables. People are looking in with pints. It's, it's crazy. And then uh, a week after the meeting, somebody takes this uh, diamond that they found on the floor and takes it to a jeweler and says, this diamond came from heaven. And uh, because this diamond came from heaven, uh, can you please evaluate it? Because it doesn't seem to have any blemishes of any sort on this diamond. And, uh, and they go, okay, I'll have a look at it. And then it turns out it's costume, costume jewelry because, uh, of course, it was inside a function room where weddings happen, and that happened on the floor. And uh, the wheels are turning round. They're turning round and round. The wheels are turning round, round and round. Now, that verse that the guy used in um, Ezekiel is Ezekiel uh, chapter 10. And the context that he uses that in is incredibly important. It's God's presence is on these wheels, and then there's the throne, and then God sits upon this throne. And that's all we heard that night. But the true context of the story is a little bit different, and I want to use it to illustrate the bigger point that I'm trying to make today. It says in Ezekiel chapter 10, Then the glory of God departed from the threshold of the temple and stopped above the cherubim. And while I watched, the cherubim spread their wings and rose from the ground. And as he went, the wheels went with them. Essentially, the context of this story is that Israel had got things so wrong that the actual wheels this guy was talking about was that God was wheeling out of his own temple. 
that things had went so amiss and so awry that things needed to change so much that the presence of God departed from his own temple. That's the true context of that story. And I want to use that example today to talk a little bit of what we think about when we first think of worship, because worship has been conditioned to how good it sounds on a Sunday morning, if I'm squeaky or not, if things are right or not right, whereas actually worship and its biblical essence is far, far different and far more beautiful. So let's hope the wheels are not turning around, and let's hope we get things in context today. Jesus met with some of his disciples in Mark 9, and this will be our passage we continue to use. And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the, out, the house, they asked him, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And then he sat down, and he called the twelve, and he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last, and a servant to all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them. And in taking him, he said, Whoever receives one such of a child receives me. And whoever receives me, not receives not just me, but he who sent me. Now Jesus, this context of this is Jesus just explained the grandeur of all that he is, of all that he could be. And then he places a child in the midst and says, See this child? This is, this is the way, and this is what the kingdom is like. Now, the context in which the world which Jesus was about was the big military superpower of the day was the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire achieved peace with a thing called the Pax Romana. Everyone say the Pax Romana. The Pax Romana. It means the peace of the Romans. And the peace was achieved by killing uh, the enemies of Rome. It was brought about by powerful people oppressing the powerless. It was about robbing people of their culture and achieving peace in very unpeaceful and violent means. And at the very top of this model was the Caesar. And everybody was under the Caesar, and Caesar stood on top of him, and this is called the Pax Romana. But when Jesus enters this world, he brings about a culture which is incredibly different to that. It's one called downward mobility. Everyone say downward mobility. Downward mobility. And essentially, downward mobility is a complete countercultural claim that you really find wholeness in life when you descend. You really find wholeness in life when you lower yourself and serve. Jesus' peace is brought about by embracing the outcasts, about caring for people, about going the extra mile, about loving people. Downward mobility is about giving up on the game that you can win and realizing that if you want to know how really life works and how worship really works, it's about serving others. And that's downward mobility. And Jesus answers that question of who is the greatest by placing a child in the midst. It says again, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and the servant of all. And he took the child and put them in the midst of them. And taking their arms, he said to them, whoever receives such a child in my name receives me. And he doesn't just receive me, he receives the one who sent me. Now, in Aramaic, the word child and servant are used interchangeably. There's almost a dual level within the society of a servant and a child. But Jesus elevates the role of the child and says, unless you become like this child, you will not find out the true secrets of the kingdom. But that's so different from how we think about worship, really. We don't really think about worship as service. We think really worship about the songs. And so much of my life and so much Christian energy has been given to uh, finding the right songs, contemporary songs, songs that the adults will enjoy, songs that the kids will enjoy. Too many organ songs, not enough organ songs. Oh no, there's no more organ songs. Um, I don't like the worship leader's clothing. They smile too much. They don't smile enough. And on and on the list goes. But all the while, I think we miss the point that worshiping God is about what we do 
and not how just we sing. My gateway into doing anything connected with youth work was a youth event that I put on when I was 17 called Gig for God. Yes, that's right, Gig for God. It's that cringy a title. And me and my friends at the time um, all got together and we, uh, in this youth hall in Craig's Hill in Livingston, and we called it the Odd Red Shed, right? And it was essentially two porter gabins sellotaped together. Um, but because it was so old and so rustic, it meant that you could do anything with it. So the week before the gig, um, we were Gore-Texing up the walls to blank out all the light. On the Christmas one, we went to Asda and just about cleared it out of wrapping paper and wrapped up the walls for the entire place. Um, we had, um, it was more like rock music, so we were playing rock music. One time we tried to get a rapper, it didn't quite work out. We did uh, lots of different stuff. I remember printing stuff out of my mum's printer for ages, running her through it ink. We got cans of iron brew, we printed out flyers. I learned how to use Photoshop because we must get people to go to the gig. Uh, there was so much energy and attention to do it. And then we got young people coming and worshiping, right? Young people from across West Lothian came and worship. Now, in, 10 years ago in Livingston, getting 50 young people to a youth event in Libby was nigh on impossible. But we did it, right? We built it and we sung songs and they raised their hands and they uh, proclaimed all sorts of things. It was a brilliant time. And I remember this um, young person coming up to me at the end, and it, some t it happened quite a lot. This young person came up after this um, experience in this time of worship and said, this changed me forever. And he was almost shaking when he said it. He said, this changed me forever. And I was going, wow, that's amazing. You know, all that effort is worthwhile. All these, um, all Gore-Tex in the walls and wrapping the walls up with paper and singing the songs, that, that was all worth it. And then I never saw him again. And I never saw a lot of these people again. And I think as I reflect back on my uh, time as a youth worker, um, and, and being involved with youth work, I learned, I, I knew really well how to get kids to come along and sing songs that they liked. But it was much harder and far more difficult to get young people to truly worship Jesus with how they lived their life. And it's a sad indictment on my youth work career when I think about that. So now we've got past my rant, my public confessions, my stories about a mysterious prophetic piano man Let's try and answer that question. How do we worship? Well, worship isn't just about singing songs, about accepting the orphan and the alien and the widow in our midst. It's about hanging out with people who do your head in. Worship isn't about changing, given the change that we have on a Sunday morning. It's about being extravagantly generous in secret and not wanting anything in return. Worship is about taking the lower place and not fighting back to protect your status. Worship just isn't about singing songs about splitting the sea so I could walk right through it. It's about opening your doors to refugees. Worship is about giving up the game that greatness can be achieved by pushing down people. Worship is about stopping doing the wrong things so we can start to do the right ones. So how do you worship, St. John's? How do you take the lower place? Who do you hang out with that does your nutting? Who do you serve? And how do you serve the people around about you? And how do you worship with the things that you do and not just the words that you sing? Let's read the words of Jesus once again. And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you discussing on the way here? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. And he sat down, and he called the twelve, and he said to them, If anyone must be first, he must be last, and a servant of all things. And he took a child, and he put him in his arms in the midst of them. And taking him in the arms, he said, Whoever receives one such as a child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me does not just receive me, but the one who sent me. Jesus steps into our story of our own grandeur and tells us what worship is really about. 
It's about giving in to it all. Jesus steps, us, steps in and frees us from the fantasies of ourselves and shows us how to live humbly and simply. And Jesus shows us that it's all about downward mobility, that the real way to be great is if you lower yourself. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I recognize that when we think of worship first off, our thoughts might be how things are sung, the experience that we have when we worship you in church or with the CDs on or at a gig or a particular uh, pilgrimage, whatever it happens during the year. But Lord Jesus, help us to think about our lives and how we truly worship you. Help us to not just sing songs about your goodness, but to live it out in our communities. Help us not to be too pious to accept the child in our midst. And help us to love others with your love. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.